So do you discovered pituitary kinase and this is one of the most highly activated pathway in human cancers. Can you tell us more about the challenges of inhibiting this pathway in human cancer? Well the problem with pituitary kinase is that at least the the uh, pituitary kinase that's mutated, PIK3CA, is also the enzyme that mediates virtually everything insulin does. So insulin regulation, suppression of gluconeogenesis in the liver, regulation of glycogen storage in the liver, regulation of glucose uptake and glycolysis in the muscle and in fat cells is uh, it's mediated by the exact same gene that's mutated in cancer. And that creates a challenge because if we develop drugs that hit that target, they should cause hyperglycemia. And they do. And, and they do. And in fact, any drug that doesn't cause hyperglycemia, and I've had pharmaceutical companies come to me and say, use our drug, it doesn't cause hyperglycemia, it's a safer drug. I'm saying, it doesn't cause hyperglycemia, it's, it's not inhibiting pituitary kinase, at least the alpha isoform. Sure. And so the question then is, can we get an efficacy toxicity ratio where we can inhibit pi 3 kinase alpha in the tumor that has that mutation uh, without causing such dire hyperglycemia that it's a problem? Now, one way to do that, of course, is to inject insulin into the patient, and that will alleviate the hyperglycemia, and in some clinical trials, that's pretty commonly done. The problem is that we're now discovering that a lot of tumor cells that have pic 3 c mutations also have higher levels of insulin receptor. In other words, that tumor probably evolved for PI3 kinase to respond to insulin, and then the mutation makes it respond even better. Yes. If you give enough insulin to override the insulin Activate. resistance in the liver and muscle, you're going to override it in the tumor as well. And so I think in a lot of cases, we're failing to see responses in the clinic because we're using insulin to override the, the PI3 kinase hyperglycemia, and it's overriding the effect on the tumor as well. We have other choices for trying to keep glucose down, including metformin yes. and a new drug that inhibits the sodium glucose transporter so the glucose gets mm -hmm. eliminated through sure. the bladder rather than, than suppressing gluconeogenesis. And that combination of drugs may, in fact, keep insulin low yes. so that you don't have the rebound effect on the tumor of insulin elevation. Uh, but currently, in most trials, if you look at C-peptide and measure uh, insulin... Uh, the readout for insulin. Yeah. For insulin. Uh, the patients have very high C-peptide compared to the non-treated pre-treatment uh, of the same patient. And that means that we should be worried about, even though they don't have hyperglycemia, they have hyperinsulinemia. And that could be the reason they're not responding to the drug. So I would recommend that we try to figure out how to do trials that ensure that we keep insulin low during the PI3 kinase treatments. Now that being said, there are other PI3 kinase inhibitors that don't hit alpha isoform, the delta yes. PI3 kinase inhibitor, that, uh, that, yes. gene, that gene is not mutated, but it turns out to be lineage specific for B cell growth. And so drugs that hit that uh, target mm -hmm. don't cause hyperglycemia. Uh, and so that doesn't limit the dosage one can attain and that will probably be the first PI3 kinase inhibitor uh, target approved uh, because of efficacy toxicity ratios are better controlled. Thank you. So, so the insulin receptor is overexpressed in some breast tumors, for example, but it's not widely recognized or it's not even subgroup. You were proposing in one of the talks that this should serve as new subgroup in breast cancer. Can you comment on this? Yeah, I think that uh, if I, for example, were diagnosed with a cancer, uh, the first thing I would want to know is whether my tumor has high levels of insulin receptor expressed on the tumor. Insulin receptor is the best possible way to activate PI3 kinase. So if you believe that PI3 kinase is contributing to the growth of the tumor, and the survival of the tumor, and the survival in the metastatic setting, then you would be very worried if your insulin level was high and that you had uh, the receptor. and you had the receptor on your tumor. That's the best way to activate it. So I would be on a ketogenic diet the very next day and I'd probably go on metformin on top of the ketogenic diet to keep my insulin level low, not to keep the glucose low. Of course, that, that's sure, obtained that's as well. Yeah. But my goal would be following my insulin levels and keeping those as low as possible. So no one yet has, obviously it's not standard of care to do what I just said, 
And and for a lot of patients, if the insulin receptor is not high on the tumor, sure, then they justified. don't need to worry yeah, about sure. insulin. But um, if it is, I would be very concerned. So we need a CLIA compliant insulin receptor assay yes. and to do clinical trials to test whether what I just proposed is really true or not. And if so, then I think it will ultimately be standard of care that you automatically look at insulin receptor, sure. not just in breast, but yes. in and other cancers. all tumors. Yeah, sure. And if it's high, you the, the clinician's job is to keep insulin levels Level. low. And we may see that that will have a big benefit for the patients. There are certainly retrospective analyses. For example, patients on metformin uh, have a better outcome in a variety of different tumors. And there are various hypotheses for why that's true, but my guess is that in most cases it's due to lowering insulin levels that metformin is having an extended lifespan for cancer patients. Sulu, you published over 450 papers and we will unfortunately want to be able to discuss all your discoveries. I would like that you tell us more about your studies on cancer metabolism, which is linked to what we just discussed. Yeah, well, I, I became interested in cancer metabolism. As, as I say, as a graduate student, I worked on metabolism, on how ATP is synthesized in the mitochondria and chloroplasts, and uh, have really been a fan of understanding how cancer controls metabolism throughout my career. At the time, I should say that I was a graduate student, uh, Warburg's ideas of, of uh, chemiosmotic were very popular at that time. And as oncogenes were being discovered, people forgot about the Warburg effect. And I remember in about 2005, I was giving a lecture at Harvard Medical School on cancer. And I, I was there. And I asked how many people have heard yes, of I Warburg. And I don't think there, anybody yes. in the audience had ever heard of the name Otto yeah. Warburg. And, yeah. and uh, so to me, it was kind of shocking that we'd raised an entire generation of yes. graduate students and postdocs know. and medical uh, medical doctors who had never heard of Otto Warburg, even though he was the dominant force. And he got Nobel Prize. And had a Nobel Prize. And, uh, uh, and it, it's, his discovery was the basis for using FDG PET sure, for absolutely. monitoring tumors. So clearly this focus on oncogenes and what they do had divert, we'd create a new generation of people who'd forgotten the history of metabolism being important in cancer. And, but at about the mid-2000s, it was becoming more and more obvious as we were chasing down what MYC does, what PI3 kinase does, what HIF does, et cetera, et cetera, that they were all controlling metabolism. metabolism all yeah. their targets, most of their targets were metabolic processes. And um, so that's what got me back to metabolism again. I wanted to understand in more detail what those connections were. A lot of the substrates of AKT were enzymes uh, involved in metabolism or pathways that indirectly controlled metabolism. So that, uh, that's how I got back interested in it again. Is there any other contribution from your lab that you would like to tell us about? Well, I think that, uh, that you know, there are many different uh, discoveries we've made in my laboratory. I think the, the, the lesson that I would like to give to the audience is that uh, virtually everything that I did in my career that uh, was important and surprising was complete accident, and usually an artifact due to some contaminant in some commercial <laughs> product. Uh, paying attention to the unexpected result, like the spots yes. on the thin layer running slightly at the wrong location. Uh, the way we discovered PIP3, you know, we, we discovered PI3P uh -huh. by this migration difference, but the fact that the same enzyme could phosphorylate PI45P2 to make a triply phosphorylated species was, uh, we didn't make till a few years later, and uh, the, the way we discovered it was because uh, we uh, had noticed that the PI3 kinase could con convert PI4P to PI34P2. Mm -hmm wasn't very efficient at doing it, but it would do it. And we were following that reaction when one day it quit working. Uh, Leslie Sarunian, my postdoc who was doing this, observed that uh, she came to my office and said that the enzyme doesn't do this anymore. It will still convert PI to PI3P, but it won't convert PI4P to PI34P2. And as we began to go over the thin layers and see when did it suddenly quit working, 
uh, we realized that she just bought a new bottle of PI4P. And, uh, and so we went back and did iodine stain on the thin layer, and it turns out that the new bottle PI4P, the product or that the, the materials in that bottle was not running on the thin layer what it was supposed to. It was running to position of PI45P2 rather than 4P. And we looked at the origin, we noticed there was a spot just off the origin <laughs> that was appearing when we switched to the new bottle. Yeah. And that turned out to be PI345P3. So I'd like to think that I was so intuitive that the media leapt to my mind that if it could phosphorylate PI3P, if it could also put a 3-phosphate on the position of PI45P2 to make the triply phosphorylated lipid. But since we had never looked at that spot, that yeah. position on the thin layer, and it ran so close to the origin that we just thought it was a contaminant in the ATP, it had never occurred to us until God had intervened and said, this guy is so stupid, he'll never figure this out. I'll just switch What's the that? labels on the bottle. <laughs> Do him a favor. And uh, I, I remember calling up the company that made oh. the... Uh, and telling them they put the wrong label on the bottle and they said no no no, no. no it's not possible we would never do that and they sold thousands of that bottle with the wrong label and nobody else ever complained oh, I know. <laughs> but um, yes yeah, so there were, there were a whole series of accidents like that yeah. that were some impurity in a, con in a commercial reagent or even mislabeling of commercial yeah. reagent led to an observation that that uh, turned out to be far more important mm -hmm. than the question that we was before us. <laughs> yes, the data are always true. It's the interpretation, how we analyze the data. So, yeah. so when I was in uh, Boston, we always people always said, "Oh, in Lou's lab, follow the data, not the textbook." <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, since I had never taken a biology course, I didn't oh, so know. you don't know about the textbook? I was never, <laughs> I'd never did, you know, tried to avoid the textbook because I didn't want to be prejudiced in interpreting the outcome of my experiments. Of the data, yeah. So, Lou, you trained many <coughs> students and postdocs, and many many of them are now leaders in their field. How important is this to you? Well, it's, it's really very exciting that the people who trained in my lab uh, have done so well. Um, I think part of that, of course, is because I was in a position where really outstanding people came to my lab. Uh, and so my goal was just not to uh, make things worse for them. <laughs> Uh, I took, I ran my lab, run my lab a lot like uh, Guido Guidotti ran his in that I gave people total freedom to work on anything they wanted to work on. So if you find really bright people and tell them do whatever you want to do and, and can provide the resources for that sure, to happen. And the guidance one. Uh, and of course the feedback of yeah, does sure. this make sense, to, et cetera, uh, then uh, you give them a chance to really pursue something that's that uh, for their creativity at a time in their life when they're likely to be very creative. And importantly, I've made it well known to people in my lab that they can take whatever they work with them, yes. reagents, uh, and anything, the idea. Some I, of them even take the technician with them. Even the technicians <laughs> go with them. Guys. In fact, almost always the technicians <laughs> go with them. They train the technician while they were postdoc, and then the technician goes with them, and they. Uh, and all the reagents and everything. So that gives them a chance to launch their careers. And I always assume that if what they discover in my laboratory is important, then there'll be a thousand people working on it. And so it doesn't matter whether somebody else sure. in my lab also works on it. If what they're doing is unimportant, then it doesn't matter <laughs> the way they or anybody else works on it. <laughs> so, but fortunately, most of the things that these really brilliant people will discover in my lab turn out to be important and expand a new field and, and there's enough room for a lot of people to work in that field Absolutely. and I, I and try to maintain communication with and reagent transfer sure. and even co-grants. And you do a gathering with them, I know at ACR you invite all your former lab members for a dinner or for... Yeah, we get together, we party together, we have fun together. So Lou, your lab members, I, I know many of them, love you, why is that? Well, I think part because I let them do whatever they want to do, uh -huh. and I take them out for a glass of wine every week. <laughs> <laughs> so what's to complain about? <laughs> so Lou, when somebody is famous like you, people sometimes tend to create a legend. You know, which, which one of the following statements is true and applies to you? People said that when Lou wants to learn a new topic, he wakes up at 4 a.m. every day until he masters it. 
Is that true? I've been told this several times. Uh, not at, no, not at 4 a.m. I do typically wake up at 6 a.m. And uh, then study the topic. And, and sometimes, I definitely spend a huge amount of time on the weekends uh, or on airplanes, if I can get onto the internet, <laughs> um, really searching down ideas. I, I like, even though I started as Department of Systems Biology, for me, the system starts with some perturbation at a single protein or even a single phosphorylation site that I find intriguing and asking what is that doing, doing yeah. and then ultimately how does that affect the entire system. Uh, so I spend a lot of time looking at uh, evolutionary conservation and not only in protein sequences but also in sites of modification, phosphorylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, methylation. So how do these modifications affect the function of a protein? And what are the pro what's what's doing it, and what aspect of that is conserved through evolution, that may be far more important than just one particular yeah. case. Uh, so, I really, you know, I, I spend a huge amount of time. Anytime someone, even while I'm at a seminar, if somebody mentions a gene I don't know much about, I immediately pull it down, take it to a phosphocyte, look at the sites that are phosphorylated, scan sites, yes. see what so the kinases are likely mm -hmm. to be and then go look through evolutionary conservation so that in a period of five minutes or so, I can probably figure out very quickly what the kinase is that phosphorylated it, whether it's conserved through evolution, and where, therefore whether it's likely to be something really important mm -hmm. to pursue. Uh, and then as soon as I get that data, I immediately email it off to everybody that sure. has worked in my lab, or currently working in the lab, who I think might have uh, a reagent or an idea Mm -hmm. that could test whether this was right. So the scan site is now publicly available, right? Oh, yes, uh, But this emerged from work in your lab. That's Can right. Can you tell so us about a little bit about scan site? Yeah, scan site, we really started um, back in, in the mid-1990s uh, with the observation that using peptide libraries we could tease out the, the specificity of SH2 domains and protein kinases. Uh, and, and generate matrices that would predict, based on primary sequence, a likely site of phosphorylation biokinase or a likely binding site of an SH2 or PTB mm -hmm. domain, and wanted to convert that into global searches. But the problem was to develop, develop the software that would do that. And so several people in my lab had worked on that, uh, and uh, uh, it, it didn't really get fully implemented, though, until uh, Mike Gaffey Mike joined Gaff, the yeah. lab, who, who really... Uh, uh, d dedicated uh, quite a bit of time and effort to to get that done with a lot of help from uh, some other people. Uh, and so, uh, and Mike has continued to keep ScanSight running at MIT and updated. And uh, Ben Turk, another postdoc in the lab, has generated a lot of the matrices, particularly for the yeast. Yeah. In the old days, I'd generate all the matrices myself. Uh, I would spend my weekends, gen take about an entire weekend to generate a matrix. Uh, and then I would dump it on Mike Yaffe to put it into the system. Uh, but now other former members are dumping them in and, uh -huh. and of course coordinating that with phosphocytes sure. so that you can determine whether the predicted site really is known to be phosphorylated from data in phosphocytes. This really makes it much more powerful. And then the ultimate trick is to tie that back to evolutionary conservation uh -huh. and then you'll know what to focus on yeah. as you decide whether a particular phosphorylation event is likely to really be important to pursue. So back to the statements. So I always heard that Lou always advises us, his postdocs, to take our science seriously, but not ourselves seriously. Is that true? You said yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, okay. that's, I'm sure I've said that over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you have to divorce your ego from your scientific uh, study. And, uh, and my attitude always is it's far more exciting to be wrong than it is to be right, because my, you know, I, make, I generate hypo hypotheses from the simplest possible explanation for the observation that I make. And uh, it's a kinet being trained as a kineticist, you have to do that. Uh -huh. Because you say, uh, of all the experiments I do, the simplest possible mechanism that will explain everything I see here is this. Uh -huh. When you know that there could be ten more steps involved, it's just you don't have a technology that sees all the intermediates in the kinetic reaction. So you just come up with the simplest possible reaction and 
until you have an experiment that says the pumpkin in that sure. you finished. It's a working hypothesis and it works and explains all the data. But you know it's not right. You just know that it's the simplest explanation. So my approach to biology is the same. I look at all the data I see there and say the simplest possible explanation requires the least number of steps, the least number of you know mysterious mm -hmm. interventions, divine interventions, would be this. And so let's propose that's right. Now, if that turns out to be right, it's really boring. Because you're done. it means you're done, there's nothing else to do, you're actually... Sure. But in biology, it's always more complicated yes. than this. So proving yourself wrong means that you've discovered that it's more complicated sure. than the simplest possible explanation. And that's exciting. Absolutely. So it doesn't, you shouldn't tie your ego ever to your hypothesis. Your ego should be, you, you're excited because you disproved your hypothesis. You that have a new challenge. It leads you to the next one, <laughs> which will also be wrong. But it'll lead you to the experiment to prove it wrong, which will get you the, even the more, next more complicated hypothesis. So that's what I mean by divorcing your ego. You can't have an ego tied to a particular hypothesis. You get locked in a particular century of being obsolete because you always, it's always, biology is always more complicated than we can imagine. Um, and the truth is the only thing that really matters, how it really works, not who discovered it. Sure, or, at the end of the day, yes. And if you can, obviously your goal is to prove yourself wrong before somebody else does. It's less embarrassing that way. <laughs> People also say when, when you join Lou's lab, he advises you to choose two projects. One that brings you to the lab in the morning and one that sends you home in the evening. Is that, do you say that? No, not one that sends you home in the evening. One that allows you to sleep oh, at that? night. That's right. So one to get you to bed and allow you to sleep at night and one to get you out of bed uh, to go rush into the lab to look for the result from the previous experiment. And they're never the same uh, project. The, uh, so one, obviously the one you rush out of bed to go here look at the result is, is, is an experiment that uh, is going to have a rapid turnaround time. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you a quick answer to something and it's unlikely to, uh, you know, to be a huge breakthrough. Yeah. Uh, but it could. Yes. And so that's why you're excited. Sure. And so you rush out to see, oh, if it comes out this way, I've, you know, I've got a salt paper, yeah. if it comes out this way, I may know nothing at all. But there is that excitement. Uh, the one that gets you to bed at night is the what, we, what I call class one experiments. No matter how it comes out, it's a publishable figure in a paper. Yes. And so you know that that day you did a body of work which will be a figure in a paper that may not be in the highest journal, but you have an answer. It's very straightforward. So there's a safe project that no matter what you do will be publishable. And then there's the risky project, which could be a huge breakthrough. And that's the one that gets you out of bed. So you mentioned class one experiments. What are class two experiments? So class two experiments are experiments. Uh, so the class one experiments uh, is one of which properly designed can only have two outcomes. And it's like a yes, no. And either one gives you important Figure. information. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like asking, uh, I know the number is between one and a hundred, what might it be? And if you say, is it greater than 50? Mm -hmm. And if the answer comes out, yes, you've learned something. If it turns out to be no, you've learned an equal something. amount of information. So the yes and the no is equally informative and it narrows down the possibilities of what else, what else you should be doing. The class two experiment is that one answer is very useful, is conclusive, like the yes answer yeah. is conclusive, and the no answer, you, still don't, know. you don't know anything at all. <laughs> it's as though you didn't even do the experiment. Yes. So it's, you, and, and a lot of people talk them out of doing the experiment because they say, well, if it comes out this way, I won't learn anything, so I won't do it. But, so, but if it comes out this way, you will learn something. Yeah. And a priori, there may be an equal probability that it will come out either way. So a good example of this is you want to know, is there gasoline in my car? Mm -hmm. So the simplest experiment is to go in and turn the key. Yes. And if it starts, there's gasoline in your car, and the gas, gas gauge will come on and it'll tell you how much gasoline you have. So that's a really very successful experiment. If it doesn't start, you know nothing. Yes. It's it's gonna, it's there are a thousand reason. reasons why that car doesn't start. <laughs> <laughs> Spark plugs are missing, you know, it's flooded, yeah. it's, it doesn't have gas is one answer. Uh, so. so we should do more class one and class two and avoid class three. I guess class three, either way, you don't know anything. Well, class three, no, no, actually class three is a useful experiment as well. Class three experiment is, 
I have a band on the gel. It's 75K. Oh, my favorite protein runs at 75K. I think maybe it's my favorite protein. I have an antibody against it. I'll blot to see <laughs> it's my protein. And, of course, how many proteins are there that are 75K on the gel? About, you know, probably t a, a thousand yeah. proteins are about that molecular weight. So you got a one in thousand chance that it is your protein. And if you have enough time to waste to do a thousand such experiments, right. you're going to score every now and then <laughs> that it will be your protein. <laughs> So that's class that's three. a class three. So it's not impossible. Yeah. And in some cases, I, I don't talk about it. You just have to calculate your time. Yes. Yeah. Everything. The, the one thing that you have a limited amount of is time. Okay. And so you just have to calculate how long. It might take you a year to do a class one experiment, and you could do Absolutely. 500 class threes in the same period of time and get more information. So sometimes the class threes are better than the class ones. You have the time is the element you have to pay attention to. Yeah. So but be honest with yourself when you design that experiment. Absolutely, to know which one. A New York Times magazine mentioned once that uh, sugar scares Lou Cantley, I recall well. Yes. Do you remember that? Is that true? It's, it absolutely is true. I think sugar is the most dangerous thing that we have in our environment right now. And uh, I, I, I'm convinced it is the major problem with obesity. It's true that sugar has you know, an equal, an equal number of grams of sugar or a complex carbohydrate have ex equal, equal number of calories, but the difference is in the kinetics. And so again, I was trained as a kineticist. And the kinetics of sugar metabolism are very different from the kinetics of metabolism of exactly the same amount of mass, same number of calories of a complex carbohydrate that's slowly decomposed. Mm -hmm. And the main reason comes back to insulin. So if you eat something that's slowly metabolized, your insulin levels may n really not change much at all throughout the digestion yeah. of that food because the glucose is released so slowly yeah, into the bloodstream yeah. mm -hmm. that it's consumed in the brain, the muscle, or stored efficiently as carbohydrate, as glycogen in the liver, without insulin levels hardly changing at all. But if you acutely drink a soda that has sugar, sugar in it, then your, so your glucose spikes within five minutes. Yeah. Insulin levels like go extremely high. And then, of course, an hour later, that overshoot of insulin causes the glucose to be overly consumed into the muscle and fat mm. and stored as glycogen. And now you have hypoglycemia, and you're desperately hungry again. To get more sugar. While in the case of eating the complex yeah. carbohydrate, it's still slowly being released into your system. You're not hungry at all. And so the problem is we've been trained to study obesity based on total calories eaten. Mm -hmm instead of studying the kinetics of the consumption of the calories and metabolism of the calories. And once you think of it this way, you really realize the important thing in, in maintaining calorie balance and not overeating is that you reach satiety, that yes. you're not hungry all the time. If you're hungry all the time, you're going to eat again yes, and again sure. and again. And that's the problem with sugar. It makes you hungry all the time. Not to mention the additional complexity that the fructose, which is half the mass mm -hmm. of sucrose and more than 60% of high fructose corn syrup, is uh, doesn't actually give you energy, any energy in your brain muscle. Uh, it only goes into the liver and gets stored as yeah. fat. So you're really only getting half the amount of it immediately available energy that you would get from a slowly decomposing yes. uh, metabolized starch. Uh, plus it's stored, the remaining material that was of no use to your brain or muscle is being stored as fat. So you're generating fat without yes. having as much uh, calories available for immediate consumption. So it's the worst possible thing to do. You might ask, well, why did we evolve to like sugar if sure. it's such a bad thing? And the reason is that evolutionarily, it was rare that we ever had any sugar in our environment, at least any rapidly releasing mm -hmm. sugar. And it was only at the end of the growing season when fruits and vegetables ripened mm -hmm. and turned very sweet. Yeah. And no doubt the plants, this is a case of uh, symbiosis where the plant realizes, not the plants think sure. that much, but <laughs> the plants yeah. that Evolved would convert yeah. to sugar that would, in, would uh, drive animals to eat it, their seeds would get Spread propagated. And, propagated, and yeah. you wouldn't eat the seed until it was mature, yeah. and that's when you would turn it to sugar. And th what the animal gets out of this is that uh, that's the time of the season where you need to put on fat because it's probably unlikely to be much food to eat over the next three months. Yes. So storing as much fat as possible at the end of the growing season ensures you survive to the next growing season. And as long as you only overeat sugar you know, one month out of the year yeah. and the rest of the year you have no sugar, which is historically what's been true, 
of, of humans for the last 100,000 years, then sugar is not a problem. The problem we have today is it's available all the time. Yes. And so we're continually preparing for hibernation or for this famine, which yes, never arrives. Yes, never arrives, <laughs> yes. But fructose is widely used in many of the yogurts, and uh, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I never buy yogurt that has sugar in it. Yeah. So anything that says non-fat, don't buy, that means they've replaced the fat with, with sugar, sugar, which is worse for you than fat. It'll make you hungry all the time. Yeah. So if you eat a, f a yogurt that's whole milk yogurt, then you may not want to eat for another four or five hours. Yeah. If you eat the same amount of yogurt in which the fat has been withdrawn and yeah. has been replaced with sugar, you'll be hungry an hour later. Yeah. I'll guarantee more, yeah. And that, So you'll eat another one and another one and another mm -hmm. one. So another statement, Lou. Lou Cantley adores Italy. We are in Italy. We are in Italy. Yeah, well, you can see why. Look at us <laughs> right now. We're a beautiful sunny day, that beautiful background, the mountains, Tuscan blue sky. What's not to like? And the food, of course, is great. Yeah, absolutely. And not too much sugar. And not too much sugar, yes. Lou, in addition to all your duties, you are also the editor or the co-editor of Cancer Discovery. What is particular and special about this journal? Well, Cancer Discovery, uh, Jose Vesalga and I decided to start. Well, actually, the truth is, we were asked to start this journal uh -huh. uh, by Marge Fodi and Tyler Jacks Jack, yeah. and, and the ACR uh, board of directors. Uh, and the reason we agreed to do it, in part, was because we had already, Jose was part of my stand-up to cancer team, and uh, and so we already had a good relationship. We were collaborating, you know, uh, and, and he had complimented you know, his area of expertise really complemented my area of expertise. He knew everything about clinical trials. I knew nothing. I knew, had, you know, figured out the pathways for the PI3 kinase pathway. He was trying to implement those in the clinic. And uh, we realized that we had a good ability to communicate with each other. We felt like we backed up each other with regard to levels of expertise between uh, the bedside and the bench. And, uh, and we were both also frustrated by uh, the increasingly long period of review required to get important papers into press these days, uh, much longer than it took 20 years ago to get papers published, uh, and felt a frustration that in spite of electronic publishing, we had actually made the whole task of getting a very important discovery into the public uh, uh, media uh, much more complicated. So we were slowing down science by the way papers were being reviewed. So we wanted to have a team of professional editors who, uh, and reviewers uh, who really knew this cancer well from pitch to bedside, had a lot of experience in that area, uh, and an editorial board of academics who we trusted their advice, uh, if not for their own reviews, but for the pick people to review. And then for us ourselves, to look over every single manuscript that got to the review process to decide whether we wanted to go forward with publishing it. And to be able to do all that in a short period of time. And it's not easy. It's not easy to do it because we're all busy people. Uh, but one of the, one of the uh, assumptions that we made, or I guess one of the uh, decisions that we made early on, was that we weren't going to send out many, many rewrites of the manuscript and bring in more and more external reviewers that we would make a decision uh, early and that uh, we would overrule reviewers that we thought they didn't get the, con the concept of the paper. And so we look at our reviewers as giving advice, not as the person doing the decides. job of the editor. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that has accelerated the publication. We have, I think, compared to most other journals that are our competitors, uh, we have a more rapid turnaround time. Uh, we only have a few manuscripts per month that we publish, but they're all extremely high quality. And the consequence of that is that uh, uh, last year, when we first had our chance to be reviewed, we to to have a uh, we had been in the system long enough to have an impact factor. We had a double, digit. a double digit impact factor in the very first time, and that I don't know if that's ever happened yeah. before with the journal that has just started. And we're looking to see what it will be this year, but I'm very optimistic it will be quite high. Uh, so it's been great fun starting that journal. So what's your conception of peer review? 
and how one can improve it. Well, as I said, well, the, the things I just mentioned, I think, is what we need to do. But for the reviewers, what do you expect a reviewer to provide when you send manuscript to a reviewer? What do you expect them to, to do? Or how do you review papers when you get paper yourself as a reviewer, not an editor? Yeah, well, for, my, for me, the f most important question is, is it right? Is it important and is it right? So if I believe it's important and I believe it's right, then the issue of have you done every possible model and multiple things, it's just that to me that's uh, a way of delaying the publication. And I think, quite honestly, a lot of scientists review manuscripts with the intent of how can I slow this down? <laughs> and I just think that's not correct. That isn't how we should proceed. Uh, and so having supplemental figures of, you know, 70 supplemental figures that no are doing a whole lot of controls that, in fact, don't have any effect at all on the conclusions of the manuscript. I've been a number of cases I've submitted a manuscript that's taken two years to get accepted. I look at the figures in the final manuscript and the abstract that I wrote and the conclusions, and there's not a single word different in any of that, which meant that that two years of revising and going through multiple reviewers had no impact at all on improving the paper. It just slowed it down. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are some cases where reviewers really have an insight that and dramatically improves, improves the paper. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen as well, even with my own papers. So, but the goal should always be to as quickly as possible get a breakthrough discovery published if it's correct. If the fundamental observation you have confidence is correct, then all of these side issues, you know, I, I think we, we're getting too bogged down in things that slow down. Delaying, yeah. I can, I mean, I remember back in the uh, 70s and 80s uh, and even 90s when Cell was getting started uh, and Ben Lewin would decide he wanted, he saw a paper that he thought was exciting. Uh, he would sometimes call me up, I was on the editorial board or a consultant for them at that time, and say, this looks exciting to me, can you tell me whether it's correct, is it accurate, is this really true? Uh, and I want the answer by tomorrow if possible. And this was before email, so it would yeah, arrive by fax. taxi. Ah, oh, by taxi. No, by taxi. Sure, yeah. It was yeah, in Boston. Send it to me. I would look at it and say, yes, it absolutely, you know, it's, this is correct. I mean, of course, they could do sure. 17 more experiments, but the fun will observe. Contained correct. enough controls already to, to show There's you. There's no doubt they cloned the right gene, yeah. is okay. what they say. And that paper would appear in hard copy a week later. Wow. From the time the paper was received until Stop. it actually came out of hard copy. Would be a week. And today we're happy if we get six months. Yes. So what is it? You know, wh why are we so slowed down? And today we have emails, we have all internet. And yeah, but it hasn't, it hasn't sped things up. Yeah. So Lou, what would you advise a junior faculty who is going to start her or his lab to work on mouse models of cancer or to work on breast cancer in general? What would you advise them? Well, I think the first thing I would do, I mean, it depends on what sort of questions you're asking. If you really want to be translational and you want your and what you're working on to have an impact in the clinic ultimately and in maybe a clinical trial or validating a drug target for a new approach for therapy, you really have to start from what's doable in the clinic and work backwards. And that's, we seldom do that. You have to ask, okay, if you were going to run a clinical trial, a phase one clinical trial, what would be the setting? Well, invariably, it would start out in a metastatic disease. So how often do we start out with a mouse model of metastatic disease to validate our target? Usually, we're asking, the does way. the target cause metastasis? But that isn't what you would do your clinical trial. Your clinical trial, metastasis has already occurred. Yes. Maybe occurred three years ago. And so it's a well-established metastasis that you're going to be examining in a clinical trial. And yet, we don't design our mouse models sure. to do that. We could but we don't. Obviously not three years, the mouse doesn't last that long. But we can get metastasis into the mouse if we work at it. That, that is well established and transmissible to litter mates. Secondly, obviously if it's a, if you want to know whether you're affecting the immune system, you have to have an immune competent That's mouse. Not modeled, yeah. and, uh, and pay attention to that. Uh, so there is no model that's perfect, but I do think you have to think about, you have to talk to the clinician 
and say, what is the unmet need, need in that particular type of cancer, be it yes. breast or whatever? What, if you were to do a clinical trial, what would be the first trial that you would do? Because I can tell you, if the drug fails in a metastatic disease trial, then it will not move. the drug is dead, yeah. it'll never get into the adjuvant setting unless you have a really strong preclinical model saying yes. it's only going to work in the adjuvant setting and not in the metastatic setting. But rarely does someone take the drug into the adjuvant setting without approval in the metastatic setting. Uh, so we may be able to change that in the future, but that's what we're stuck mm -hmm. with. Sure. And so figuring out how to work with those kinds of models. And secondly, you've got to keep asking yourself, are the mutations that I'm using to, d to examine my metastatic model the same mutations that show up in the human metastatic model? Mm -hmm. Which means you've got to go ask, sure. what are the mutations in the metastatic model? And often we don't know that. We know what the primary tumor was, but we don't know what it was in the metastatic. So having that information and design your mouse model to replicate that so that when you go to the clinicians and say, I think this is only going to work for metastatic mutations that have this series of genes mutated, and the reason is, I know that that's 20% of sure. your population of metastatic disease, and I've engineered exactly these same mutations, and I have metastasis, and I throw these drugs in, and it works in that mutational background, and not in four other mutational backgrounds that are in the metastatic setting. That's what's going to influence uh, the pharmaceutical companies to mm -hmm. say, yes, we can select patients that are likely to respond to your drug. We're impressed by the fact that it only works in that set category, it's not a general toxin, toxic yes. compound. It really is targeting, and uh, and that's what will also these days convince the clinicians sure. that's an exciting sure. trial to do. Sure. They want to be involved in those those trials that are really science based more and more so today. So this would be for new faculty who would like to do translation research, and in general, what would you advise somebody who is starting? Your what do you advise your postdocs when they leave the lab? Well, I'm not saying that everyone needs to be translational, but if, you, if that's your goal, to be translational, then, I, sure. then you've got to start with what you see sure. in the clinical setting and work your way backwards. And um, that, that, that we typically haven't done. Uh, but I mean, there's a lot to be learned still that we wouldn't yet call translational. Sure. Have we discovered all the mechanisms by which a tumor can form? Obviously not. Uh, there's, there's, there's much more to harvest there. Uh, understanding the connections between stem cells. This question of can you only go one direction, I think I'm pretty convinced in solid tumors. In many cases, you go backwards from sure. thermally differentiation tissue back. Plasticity between different cell states. The more, that's, that's right. So there's a lot of plasticity once. The one thing to remember is that when it comes to cancer, there are no rules. Whatever works, works. Whatever will allow a given cell and its progeny to grow better than the cells around them sure. has the potential to be a cancer. And there are thousands of ways that can happen. Uh, a given tissue has, it's more likely to result in one set of evolutionary pathways to solve that problem. Because of the methylation state of the DNA or the surrounding metabolites or the surrounding microenvironment will influence what works in that mm -hmm. tissue. That's why all tissues don't have the same mutations. Sure. But Whatever works in that environment works, and there'll be thousands of solutions in any environment. And we have to get away from the concept that cancer is a predetermined evolutionary event. Yeah. It's, it's a random event. So, Lou, what would you like to tell the next generation of scientists who will watch this video? Well, I'd say uh, <clears throat> take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> these are, these are uh, you know, my opinions and. Uh, I, actually, I think the most important thing is that that you love science. That you know, as you know, Larry Bird once said uh, when he got a contract yeah. to, from the Boston Celtics, his contract re renewed a multi-million, I think it was eight million dollars a year or so to play. And and he was asked in the press conference, well, you know, what do you think about getting this this money? He says, well, you know, I, I'm shocked they're paying me so much money. He says I would do this for free. <laughs> this is like my obsession. <laughs> And they're actually paying me to do it, said, but I'll take the money. <laughs> so I think the bottom line is that uh, if you really want to go into science, you have to love it because it's not an easy way to make a living. Uh, but if you really love it, then you'll be passionate about it. You'll work around the clock. You'll pay attention to what the truth is because that's where you want to get. And ultimately, it's possible to, to live a pretty good life 
uh, if, if you follow your instincts and follow what the truth is. So, Lou, is there any question that I should have asked, but I didn't? No, I think you asked uh, plenty of questions. <laughs> so, thank you very much. It was a pleasure interviewing you.